I'd like to welcome everybody to the Spokane Plan Commission hearing for Wednesday, October 25th, 2023. Uh, before we begin our process, I'm going to read some rules on our hearing procedures. Uh, please follow these follow, following rules. Please silence your cell phones when entering the council chambers. No clapping, cheering, or booing. No public outbursts. Uh, there will be a time limit on testifying, and we will give everybody, since we have a, some good detail here, we will give everybody four minutes a person. All persons and or commission members shall wait to be recognized by the president before speaking. Persons testifying are asked to avoid repetition and limit comments to specific project and code compliance. Each speaker shall follow all instructions from the president so that their remarks may be heard, understood, and recorded. All comments to the plan commission shall be directed to the secretary to be appropriately entered into public record. This includes oral, written, and email comments. No modes of expression not provided by these rules, including but not limited to demonstrations, banners, applause, profanity, vulgar language, or personal insults will be permitted. In the event such disorders persist, the president may require the removal of the instigators, recess, or adjourn the meeting. Okay. So before we begin, Angie, if you can take roll, please. Michael Baker. Jesse Bank. Todd Bayrother. Here. Greg Francis. Here. Chris Neely. Here. Ryan Patterson. Here. Carol Shook. Tim Williams. Here. Cliff Winger. Here. Christopher Britt. And Immunity Assembly Liaison, Mary Winkus. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. And I will say, just for the record, that Jesse Bank did need to recuse himself because he is the executive director of the Northeast, Northeast PDA, so, uh, and he had submitted written comments. Okay, so we are going to have a hearing on general facilities charges, and we will start off with Catherine Miller. Welcome, Catherine. Okay, thank you very much for your time today. Um, with the two workshops that we went through, just wanted to give you a higher level conversation so you can get right to uh, your process of the deliberation. Not sure if we're getting your audio completely. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Hello. Ooh, that's better. Better? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I'll just dive into it uh, just to say that we did talk about some of these slides in your, in your workshops previously. Uh, there was a lot of public outreach both prior to council approving the ordinance that's in place since March of this year, as well as afterwards in terms of the work we did, um, uh, pre and post, if you will. Uh, significantly speaking, we had um, uh, a lot of work with uh, our a mayor review committee where we went through and dialogued in depth and let the committee, uh, the intent of the committee was to come together and do an in-depth review of everything. We allowed that committee to go through and uh, tell us what areas they wanted to look at and discuss. And from those areas, we had basically the five areas of interest that came out or topics uh, of discussion. I called them A through E. Uh, we went through again in your workshops pretty uh, deeply on the interest, the zones, the MCEs, the phase and incentives. And again, the one new thing that came out that wasn't necessarily one of the committee's initial discussion points was the opportunity to look at five eighths inch meters as a tool, an opportunity if in fact the home is small enough, has uh, uh, Spokanescape is able to handle a uh, five eighths meter, we wanted to make that option available. Historically, five eighths meters are out in our community. Uh, they are in our older, smaller, uh, footprint uh, neighborhoods and they certainly uh, we felt that could be an option basically to come back in uh, to the community for uh, for that opportunity uh, the one clarification or the clarifications that I just wanted to highlight uh, we did talk about the updates to the sewer charge 
Uh, we need to for sure come back with an amendment to update those sewer charges. If you recall, that came out of the final work around NLT, and that was a multi-million dollar project that was closing out the same time we were working on GFCs in the background, if you will, and uh, this gave us the opportunity to get the final work from that closeout that did in fact impact the numbers, so we want to make sure we're reflecting the final numbers for the sewer charges. We also wanted to take the opportunity to clarify master meters. Those typically go in with PUDs, those planned unit development, um, <coughs> excuse me, developments, where typically they uh, put in a master meter and then over time pay a GFC as those houses come in. So we just wanted to make sure that the ordinance uh, clearly understood that there's still a GFC for those individual homes, especially in an existing PUD that has an existing meter uh, that still has houses to, to pay uh, going forward. Uh, since they didn't pay uh, to date on those. And they also have a clarifying, uh, uh, we would like to clarify the ENR index process just to make sure everyone understands this is going to be calculated from an October to October every year as we go through uh, and update to make sure once we set the costs moving forward past 2024 that they are obviously updated every year to, to stay current with costs. So in the end, there are a few options for, for this um, committee to uh, consider. Option one uh, that we dialogued before was to leave the ordinance in place, uh, plus the addition, as I mentioned, of that 5 8 uh, meter. That seemed to, there are a few items that came out of the mayor's committee that were all in consensus. 5 8 meter was definitely a consensus item um, out of there, and then update again the sewer charges as well as that ENR clarification. And so just as a reminder, uh, the existing ordinance has the two zones, does include interest, uses MCEs as the basis of some of the measurements there, and the uh, full GFCs will be in place March 5th, 2024. So there's no uh, phasing in, if you will, 2024. That's what that looks like. Uh, option two would be, again, making sure we have that 5 eighths option. Uh, that was, again, very well supported, updating those sewer charges and the ENR clarification. And then this is really for your group to deliberate about by project, if you will, or by topic. And again, interest to keep the interest in place uh, or removed from the calculations on the zoning. Again, there's two zones in there today or the citywide uh, uh, zone option. Uh, use of MCEs versus ERUs and the phase in. Again, uh, the full GFCs will go into effect on that March 5th, uh, 2024, as the current ordinance sits. Uh, the, you know, obviously, there's lots of phase in options. I've just threw out one that I'll show you in the next slide uh, we're proposing as staff to, to consider. Uh, that is the half the amount uh, that's remaining to be put in 2024 and the remaining amount in 25. So basically, with the current uh, ordinance, council went ahead and kind of did a soft phasing in by doing 66% of, of, of what it should be uh, from, from just the interest calculations is what they put in place since March. Uh, that's going to run through March of next year. And again, this option of going two more years. So it would give you kind of a three-year phase in if you think about it that way. Uh, and then the final one is incentives, uh, keeping the exempts, existing incentives or the package as Spencer had per, uh, presented and provided at your last workshop. So getting to staff recommendations, it is uh, to uh, amend option one to include that 5 eighths meter, that sewer update charge uh, incentives as again provided by economic development. And again, we are pr proposing a phase in over, over two years, 24 and 25. So again, just taking half of what's uh, 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 on the paper, if you will, for 2024 and then the full amount in 2020, excuse me, 2025. So again, it gives you uh, effectively a, a three-year um, uh, window of, of, of phasing in. And then again, regarding the uh, clarification on ENR and the master meters is what we would look uh, to do. So with that, uh, after, obviously after today's uh, hearing, we are scheduled to be in front of council through their study session on November 2nd. We will share obviously all of the uh, results of this hearing <clears throat> and any of the background information you collected in terms of comments uh, received. And then we are expecting council before the end of the year to uh, take some action. And then just a reminder, any of the decisions you are talking about making, those will be coming into effect after that March 4th, 2024. So anything you decide today won't come into effect until March of 2024. So we're gonna keep with the 66% charge, all those things uh, in place until then. And council also, uh, that 66% is a citywide right now. So uh, there isn't a, a zonal piece that won't be uh, impacted until again, after March uh, 4th of 2024. 
So with that, do you have any questions? Go ahead. Thank you. And uh, if I could repeat a question we talked about at the workshop and you answered. On the five ace meters, it doesn't change how the city is going to tap into the main. They're still with Correct. standardized probably on a one inch. So it becomes an owner decision on what size meter. Very much so. And it's, it's a financial potential decision if they, again, have a small enough um, 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 use and a 5 eighths would, would f fulfill their needs, then we wanted to make that option completely yeah. available and, and a choice of, of that property. And then could you clarify in, then what other requirements were proposed or are attached to a 5 eighths meter in terms of? We want to make sure we have a framework around that for, for the Spokane scape, again, to make sure that outdoor watering, typically what, what our issue is for the city of Spokane water system is that summer watering. It goes up multiples of what the inside water domestic use is. So that outside watering of the lawns is what usually, it would not, not usually, it is what taxes our system. And so again, the five eighths meter, you, you know, we're not talking about a tiny little house on three acres, for example. A five eighths meter will not handle uh, the kind of watering on, on a very large area. So we want to emphasize that by having uh, that Spokanescape. We'll have conversations with anybody that comes in the door asking about that five eighths, just to make sure again that they're they're getting something that will serve them well. Is it? Can you help me understand the argument though? Why they need to be coupled? If they choose a smaller meter, that's that's their prerogative on whether they're not going to be able to have sure this we don't want to frustrate anybody if they erroneously think they can water a, a, a acre land outside of their tiny home and they <laughs> can't because that meter is small and will not push enough water through in order to serve a large watering need so to kind of follow on with that does it require spokanescape because a lot of pre-existing homes are on small lots i'm I, it wouldn't surprise me if I have a 5 eighths meter on a 7,000 square foot lot. Uh, can it be based upon either Spokanescape or lot size? You know, so a smaller lot, particularly since we just made uh, recommended changes to reduce minimum lot size, mm -hmm. that these smaller lots can be hooked up with a uh, Sure. Five eighths meter, regardless of whether or not they're doing Spokanescape or not. At the end of the day, we want to make sure they they serve what what they have, and uh, we're not going to be uh, requiring only sp um, Spokanescape. It truly is a tool to make sure, if they want to pull it off, that we have these items available to talk about. But at the end of the day, again, that meter can only put so much water through, and we'll have those conversations to make sure that whatever their plans are, it falls well within the, what they're trying to do. Yes, Spencer. Um, we've had some conversations about this. I think the intent is the ordinance is not going to specify exactly what those requirements are. Correct. That would be um, that wouldn't really be written directly into the ordinance, but there would be requirements developed as a program around the five eighths five eighths inch meter. So ultimately, the what's important is that we would allow for that five eighths inch size in the ordinance in the fee structure, Correct. and then. Um, you know, what, what other parameters around that would be developed administratively. And as you mentioned, again, and I mentioned too, there are a lot of existing 5 8 meters right. that are working fine out there. So I really don't think it's going to be an issue as long as, as, as they're aware of the, of the limitations of a 5 8 versus larger size meters. So it'd just be part of the development process that they're going through and determining meter size based upon mm -hmm. their specific requirements. Yes. Anyone besides? Just to conclude on that, it, okay. I think I'm challenged by that it's a re additional requirements that probably help happen in a development meeting um, if they make a bad choice on trying to save a buck on their meter, right? I, so does it need to be a requirement, additional requirement, if they choose make that choice? Again, the uh, the conversation will be per lot because it could be. Yeah. Again, a million different options as they come forward, right? So we don't want to say it's going to be this way when it's not going to fit 80% of what comes through the door. So it really will be what they are desiring and then the city working with them like we always do sure. to come up with a solution that works for that everybody. Helps. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm, I have a question. Any other questions right now? Could yes. you go back to the slide with the city recommendations? Sure. Oops. 
Um, when it says incentives as provided by economic development, could you clarify what that means? Um, that was, those were the slides, and I'll just run down through them. They were presented at the last workshop. In the conversation, I'll go ahead and turn that over to um, Spencer for any Yeah, I think you can go to the next slide. This one isn't, okay. So um, the, the proposal would be to, uh, for projects that qualify as affordable and, or workforce housing projects, um, that they would in the, this was written with the assumption of two zones in mind because that's what the current, current ordinance has in place, that those projects would be charged the lower zone fee if they're in the upper zone. So a discount from the upper zone to the lower zone. Um, just as a reminder, all of that funding needs to be backfilled from some other funding source. So um, we talked a little bit about that when I presented. Um, as far as what qualifies you for that program, if you meet our MFTE requirements, requirements for our MFTE program, uh, that requires you to set aside a certain portion of the project for um, units that are rented at a certain income level. Um, the, our parking to people program would also qualify for that. So that's similar. You get a sales tax um, or a, a waiver on sales tax for the construction of a building if a certain portion is reserved for affordable. And then any... Um, housing or any project that takes advantage of state or federal affordable housing funding would also qualify for that. So again, in the upper zone, you would pay the lower zone rate and the remainder would be backfilled by some other funding source. And then in the lower zone, there would be a 50% 50 per, 50 discount on the rate. Um, the proposal would also have a cap on how much of the incentive can be made available and um, that's $40,000 for water and $20,000 for sewer. In other words, the amount of money that gets backfilled would be limited to that $40,000 or $20,000. And that effectively maps to a two-inch rate. So for projects that need more than a two-inch connection, um, the, the amount of the incentive would be limited. But for anything two inches or under, um, the, the, uh, the incentive would, would effectively go forward as the lower zone rate in the upper zone or 50% of the lower zone, depending on the location. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, is this proposed uh, incentive um, less generous, if you will, than uh, the previous precedents for affordable housing? Yes, so um, in the past, before the March adoption of this new rate structure, we waived GF, or yeah, we waived GFCs in large portions of the city and for more than just affordable housing. When the, um, when the new rates were adopted in March, there was a provision written into the code that would exempt qualifying affordable housing projects completely. Um, and the, the code specifies that that money needs to be backfilled from some other location. Um, our proposal would charge a rate, but it would be a reduced rate. So this is a difference from what was adopted in March, if that is your question. Yes. Um, and if, if I could, Catherine, I just wanted to clarify, if you could go back to the recommendation slide. Sure. Um, uh, let me go this way. It's the same slips. A lot to absorb on this topic with all the different issues, and I was, wanted to make sure I understood where sure. staff recommendations were. So on the interest issue, is there a recommendation from the staff so option one is everything in the smaller print, the two zones, oh, includes including interest the interest. And MCE. Okay. Correct. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Um, so I, I had raised questions about what I call the utilization weighting in the workshop. And I'm, I'm curious, was there ever consideration, you know, if this is a capital consideration and, and if RCW says that you know, each connection shall bear a proportionate share of the cost of the system capacity required to serve it, then wh why isn't there a weighting or an incentive based on utilization of that, the amount of infrastructure in front of your parcel? So, and I raised, I, I gave the example of if I have, someone has 300 feet of curb, meaning they're, 
there in, you know, essentially, and they have one tap, that's the same rate. So there's no waiting to, or for, for, from a zoning standpoint if they were to increase density and, to, and have higher utilization of, of public, public infrastructure. Sure, since this is a complex issue, the city actually went out and hired a <laughs> consultant, FCS, to help us through this. <coughs> FCS is uh, nationally recognized in terms of working through developing GFCs. So uh, Brooke is online right now, I believe. Possibly. I am. Can oh, you hear me? There she is. Did you hear the question, Brooke? Thank you. I, I did. And so I think it was around really, you know, why can't we maybe dial in a little bit more specifically about infrastructure in front of a, a certain development, let's say, like a line of pipe. Um, and, and what we often find is that the nexus, but oh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yes. Oh. So what we often find, though, is that the nexus really between um, what's, what's incurred by the system and what's provided by the user is really often more about the size of the meter and the amount of flow that, that can be um, run through that meter, often on the water side. And then on the sewer side, often the same, the same equivalency can be connected there. But at the end of the day, I think that the type of analysis that you're talking about is also very data intensive and something that can become you know, more of an administrative burden to try to get to that really specific cost. So I think that there's a couple things that go into that um, and the data needs often kind of um, come to the forefront in that sort of a detailed analysis. Thank you for that. It, it, another way to ask that question is, is the proportion of the capital investment on the centralized infrastructure so much greater than the actual distribution network that it, it's not relevant? The, the, the length of pipe in front of my house isn't as relevant to the capacity of the centralized um, sourcing in this case? Yeah, I think, I think that's, a, that's a good way to describe it as well. Do you have like just ballpark numbers, 80, 20 percent, what, what, you know, so we can kind of understand to not worry about I think about it'll this? range. Yeah, I think it ranges definitely dependent on the system. And so I don't have a, a specific number that I can throw out there, but, but I know that consistently throughout the industry, um, flow rates on meter sizes are a, a very good nexus um, to, to the impact on the system from an individual customer. And Commissioner, don't forget that the distribution system primarily is put in place by the developers themselves, and then they donate that infrastructure to the city. So it doesn't end up in the GFC calculation primarily. So the, di the distribution system, when you build a subdivision, is generally put in by the developer, and then that comes as a donated asset to the city at the end. So, so it, it, it already is backed out of that calculation, the actual, the original distribution pipe and then the O&M replacement would be on rates not on um, the GFC charge the replacements on that's the key isn't it the replacements on, on rates. right oh, okay. replacements on rates okay thank you I, I, I just want to conclude that line of questioning because it, it just there's an equity piece here that seems hard to grasp to understand how this is bearing a proportionate share but I, I, I I think you've answered, answered it as the best we can, but it's still a challenge to me to understand that. Sure. We are talking transmission in terms yep. of where we based our calculations from, yep. Thank which you. is the backbone. So prior to the, the March ordinance, were interest charges included in the GFC rates? Prior to, we established those over 20 years ago, and we tried the best we could to understand the methodology behind it and we did not have any uh, uh, consistent file that gave us all the answers of how they <laughs> came to all the answers. If you look at the originals we've shown in the past, they were kind of all over the board. They weren't really attached to uh, anything that we could tell in terms of uh, a smaller size. When we got to the larger sizes, it, it didn't add up. And that's, again, why we wanted to make sure we hired a very qualified group to help us make sure that we are reasonable and rational about this approach. So I'm not sure if I got Answers the question. So, so. <laughs> there was no calculations like you've seen us go through in these okay. last workshops. Very thoughtful, very rational approach. And that's what state law is asking us to do. Okay. So basically the ordinance that was put in place in March was based upon a lot more data and methodology than previously. Times 20. <laughs> Times 20. Okay. 
And then a question about the master meter. Mm -hmm. You know, it says uh, clarification on the use of master meters, but there's nothing within the packet that says what that clarification is. Sure. Uh, I mean, other than maybe paying for that meter over time as development occurs downstream of it. Mm -hmm. Is there any more clarity to it? That, that than truly that? is it. Master meters are just a little unique, and especially with PUDs. Historically, they would put the meter in place, and then again, as houses were developed, they would then come in and pay their portion of a GFC. And we weren't clear enough, we felt, in the new ordinance, just to make it blatantly clear, existing meters out there today that have still houses to build will be paying a GFC because they didn't pay it before. Obviously, if they came in and paid the GFC for everything up front, we're not talking about that group. We're talking about only the group that has chose to pay it over time as houses came in. So if a new master meter is put in place today, say a new PUD is formed, mm -hmm. I'm, <coughs> what would be the mechanism? Would it be zero cost at the very beginning and then it, with the first right. unit being developed? that's when the rate would start getting charged? So what we like to do is give them a choice. They can obviously pay it up front or do the same thing in, in process like they've done in the past. They can choose, if they don't want to pay it all up front, to pay it as houses come in. But it would be a negotiated conversation with our developer services folks. Again, they've been doing this for years in terms of how to make sure it all works out in the end. But a lot of development obviously needs the, uh, the, the sales of those houses in order to fund the next thing. So we want to make sure that option is obviously clearly there. It truly was those existing meters out there today. There was maybe a thought that they didn't have to pay anything because they already have a meter. And we just wanted to clarify, no, you, you have a meter and you did not pay your past GFC, so you will be paying a GFC. I just struggle as, as we prepare our recommendation that we didn't have that level of clarity. So it's hard to make a recommendation on something we don't know. So other than distributing the cost over the development. So it, it, thank you for clarifying that. Okay. Um, and then I know a lot of the public comment, and I, I think maybe Spencer, you covered this, was about the use of 1590 funds to backfill affordable housing. Are there other options? Uh, some of the proposals were, uh, you know, like using utility rates to pay for it over time. Is that an allowable option? So just to clarify, this ordinance does not have any of that conversation in it whatsoever. It does have a conversation of incentives, but not any dialogue of how it's paid. And as Spencer you know, said, there's multiple ways to pay for it, but it is truly a separate yet parallel uh, process and conversation. The ordinance never had any of the dialogue. It, it shouldn't really be there. It really is a, um, um, uh, a city rule or policy in terms of how we move forward. Uh, with, with implementing, but at the end of the day, uh, the state has made it clear uh, we can't not backfill any incentives, any offsets we're giving to anybody. The utility has to be remain solid uh, in terms of whole. So we're, we're kind of like, uh, we, we, wherever the money comes from, we're, we're fine with, we just need to make sure it is paid in full, regardless of how many participants paid into it, whether it was a grant or, or something else. Okay, and so that will be identified at a the mechanism for payment will be identified at a later point. Nothing Correct. we do today is going to alter that. Not, not in this, this or ordinance was, was silent to it, and it, it's not intended to be there. Okay. So is it, is it correct that the baseline was the three-quarter inch yes. meter size? Yes. The basis of the calculations is three-quarters. And then when 5 ace was added, how does one get to the same total system cost if there are... This is an option for council and, and you folks to, to deliberate about. It is not the basis of the calculation. It is an option putting forward for the opportunity to have a lower cost option. But it is outside the basis of the three quarters inch. But does it throw off the, the overall balance of the equation if, if you, or do you not have to achieve a... Well, the expectation is you're not going to have out of the 100 you sell in a year, you're not going to have 99 with 5 eighths. If, if that's the case, then we would have to go back to our calculations. Okay. It truly is that one-off opportunity that uh, people may avail themselves to. Okay, thank you. I feel like we're dominating here. So um, 
the 20 percent of capacity for sewer system that's reserved for county use is that included in as that new capacity is built out is that included in a recovery cost in the gfc's here or is it based upon the 80 percent that's dedicated to the city i'm going to let brooke answer that one as well we covered that i think briefly with you before but i think it'd be helpful to hear from her again on that Thank you. So, so ultimately, we back out that uh, the portion of the capacity that's associated with the county, and we've also backed out the cost that they've paid in to that capacity. So we both reduced the capacity portion of the charge as well as the, the cost portion of the charge as well. Thank you. So another question. We're going to have lots of questions. Well, I'm getting done. But... Uh, PDAs, mm -hmm. as far as in our recommendation, when we're looking at you know, the incentives for economic development, I don't really see anything with regards to PDAs being mentioned, except that the PDAs have an existing agreement to have GFC fees waive, mm -hmm. waived. So with our recommendation to date, does that make any alterations to those PDA arrangements or do, can we recommend changing that? If we approve it as what city staff is recommending, do the uh, PDAs remain waived? Uh, they do through the, the, the agreements that are in place and that really is a conversation with council since they entered into those agreements, how council would like to move forward with that. Uh, and, so at, at this point, again, the decisions today do not affect that conversation. It needs to happen. We've already made council aware of that conversation. Uh, there obviously are, are, are choices to make as well, and I think we've got a slide on that talking about uh, we could formally ask the PDA to pay for the GFC portion for the developer since right now their agreements say the developer doesn't pay. Uh, obviously, there's other options that council could choose uh, as well. The general fund could pay. Uh, the rate payers could pay, but at the end of the day, that discussion still needs to be finalized. Uh, if they are taken out and have uh, the PDA pay their own way uh, going forward, uh, we showed you in the past, too, that doesn't affect the calculations. And so, uh, the, again, the GFCs will not be impacted by those decisions. Just who is paying will be impacted. Okay. So this really goes kind of like to the affordable housing thing where someone's going to ultimately pay for any for those PDA GFCs, mm -hmm. it's just whether or not it's gonna be the PDA, the developer, or some other source. Correct. And so whether or not we recommended that the PDAs pay, since that capacity was already backed out, I think similar to what is done with the county, that it wouldn't change the rate. Right, we would, depending on the decision, again, when we, when we back it out, we would deliver that to the person identified to pay. Thank you. We have other questions from commissioners. Um, in considering the uh, whether to recommend MCE or ERUs, mm -hmm. um, the analysis we saw at the workshop was it was pretty close, as I recall. But I wanted to ask if a developers developing smaller units. Uh, versus, uh, you know, say, uh, larger homes. Um, is one methodology more favorable to the development of smaller units versus uh, the other? They, they both have their pros and cons in terms of what we talked about last time. Uh, the water GFC uh, versus MCE versus ER conversation was only 1.2% difference with each other. And the sewer had the seven, I think, 0.8 difference. And we talked about the fact that we don't have all the information that we would need to really get to a ERU amount uh, without further data collection. And that came down to the deep sewers being influenced by groundwater and filling up our sewer system and taking up the capacity 
that we would need to understand what's not available because groundwater is there. So then we can understand what capacity is available for development. And because that's an unknown and GFCs are directly related to capacity, GFCs pay for capacity. We wanted to make sure that if there was a decision to go with ERUs, we would need a couple year study because it's a very complex conversation when you're talking about groundwater and the influences into our sewer system to truly understand what that impact is. So then we could calculate out, again, what an ERU would be uh, from a sewer perspective. Thank you. <laughs> okay, if there are no further questions, we will move to public testimony. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are gonna uh, start with public testimony, our first, uh, Two sign-ups were from online, and we'll start with Jonathan Malhan from Catholic Charities. Good afternoon. Yeah, uh, and sorry, as a reminder, uh, each public testimony will be four-minute. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to share some comments with you today. My name is Jonathan Malahan. I'm the Chief Housing Officer for Catholic Charities of Eastern Washington. We provide over 3,000 uh, affordable homes throughout Eastern Washington, and we serve over 60,000 people through supportive services in, in pursuit of our mission to uh, support human dignity for vulnerable members of our community. I just want to share that the increases uh, proposed for the GFCs without a continuing exemption for affordable housing will have a significant impact on the production of affordable housing at a time when the demand for affordable housing is higher than it's ever been in our community. For example, the Live Tech program, which is responsible for the development of over 90% of all affordable housing developed in the U.S. since the inception of the program in 1986, uh, the average size of those projects is, is over 70 units. And so you would see an, an average impact in a live tech development of up to $1.2 million, depending on the zone and, and the, the, uh, the incentive that's charged. Uh, that's over a 5% increase in the cost of one of those projects. And it makes the project infeasible given the current sources of public funding uh, available uh, for developers of affordable housing. The $60,000 incentive would really not uh, make a dent in, in an in a, uh, increase to the budget that's that, that great. Uh, so we would encourage continued contemplation of incentives uh, uh, that would make a more meaningful impact to not put those projects at risk where most of our affordable housing is developed. We'd ask that any recommendation from the Plan Commission include uh, a, an ongoing total exemption for affordable housing, understanding that that needs to be made up by the system uh, from some other source. And we'd ask that existing affordable housing resources not be identified or cannibalized for that purpose, potentially to conflate sources like having the increased revenue to the system that's generated by the increase in rate payers uh, from the, the affordable housing development be identified as the source to repay the system over time. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll take less than my four minutes and turn it back to, for further public testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Malahan. Next will be Michelle Girido from Habitat. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Michelle Girardo, and I serve as the CEO of Habitat for Humanity Spokane. Uh, we build and rebuild places to call home in partnership with low to moderate income families to gain economic mobility through affordable home ownership. Earlier this year, Nathan, a medically retired Air Force vet, his wife Jessica, and their two young kiddos purchased and moved into their brand new habitat home in East Central. They earn 49% of the area median income, or about $42,000 annually. And like many habitat families, Nathan had a critical need for a safe, decent, affordable, and ADA accessible home for his family. However, the vacancy rate for low income housing is out of control let alone homes that comply with ADA. Rising construction material and labor costs have driven home prices to double in just the past few years. These homes are simple and decent. You won't find granite countertops in sprawling water usage. The square footage for a two to three bedroom home is under 1,200 square feet and adheres to evergreen standards requiring minimal water and utility usage. 
Habitat homeowners pay an affordable mortgage, and each of those homes is permanently affordable. Had the waiver not been in place, Nathan and his family would not have been uh, would not have had the opportunity, and they would have been priced out of that home. And had it not been for 1590 funding and funding like it, Habitat would not have been able to make this home a reality for that family. The use of waivers and 1590 funds is crucial for the success of families like Nathan. And the proposal for a partial waiver funded with $1,590 is not enough and is not what the funds were intended to do. $1,590 are this community's only local funding source. So please consider growth in the base rate and utility taxes paid by new low-income housing will more than pay for the waived connection fees. Consider that the ratepayers carry the waiver or find alternative sources. The CHIP funds would be a perfect example to balance the difference. There are big successes the city has secured to make affordable housing buildable and accessible for our neighbors in need. And if we don't have access to all these tools working together, we won't be able to see additional affordable housing and homeownership development in our beautiful Spokane. Thanks so much. Thank you. Sorry for butchering your last name again. I just do that all the time. Okay. Next uh, is Darren Watkins. Thank you, Darren Watkins with the Spokane Realtors. We have um, been on record pre uh, previously testifying to the importance of what the work you are doing here. For example, we did a poll of builders and developers in the area. We identified 2,500 projects that were at risk for uh, these increased fees at the time as they were proposed. And uh, just remember, the work you do is so important. We are 25% underbuilt. And all of the issues that we're talking about with homelessness or underhoused individuals uh, are clearly at, at risk with the talk that we're talking, the issues that we're talking about here. I would like for you to take a close look at the recommendations that came out of the mayor's committee, because I have to tell you there were great ideas and great consensus about those issues, the way that, that the way we talked about them, issues we hadn't considered with fairness, issues we hadn't considered with equity. And there are many positions in there in these recommendations that you really should take a second look at. If there's anything about this process we're concerned with, it's that staff didn't take any of those and adapt them into their own recommendations. The reason why is because some of the, for example, the first issue was a single district versus multiple districts. And it's a fairness issue. It really is about where we're driving development and where we're determining development. And then second, it is a competitiveness issue. If we raise the fees to certain areas, those aren't going to be built. And right now, you have a giant sound of moving going over to Idaho, where 84% of all new single home constructions is now being done compared to 7% within the city of Spokane. Just remember, in the last three years, we've seen a 47% reduction in new housing permits in the city of Spokane. And the single district issue, just think about this for a moment. There's a reason why these kind of fees are the most litigious that exist in development. Because what you're asking now your planning department, instead of a single fee that applies across and you can use the money anywhere you want, you now have to categorize and separate each of those funding sources in different pots. You have to assign those projects individually as they come up, uh, and it becomes a paperwork nightmare for the planning department, which we can all agree is pretty much at capacity with the work they already have. If we want to add another eight people to handle these things, maybe, but we don't want to add too much to the burden already on the city. Um, we'd like for you to back out county and PDA obligations. Greg, you identified it pretty closely. For example, how many multi-million dollars agreements did we forego with just the airport project alone? And yet those numbers are still kind of mysteriously fighting their way into those assessments. So be careful about, there isn't a reason why if Bob decides to build an ADU, he shouldn't be paying for the airport expansion. The second part of this is the uh, interest charges. If you can figure out the formula, good luck. Because we're trying to establish dollar values for when the projects were built, for the time versus today dollars. I mean, have you seen a construction loan today? It's about 12, 14%. Try to attach that to a value built 30 years ago. It was almost impossible, and it's a key reason why most jurisdictions do not adapt the interest charges for that very reason. Um, we also support the ERU system, Todd, for just what you identified. 
if a developer comes in in any other capacity, if it's inspections, if it's plumbing, if it's building permits, we're going to base it on use. How many fixtures are there? How much land do you want to water? Those are, those are an ERU system, and it just makes it easier to use both for the users and for the city. It's a clear-cut model. Uh, 20 seconds. The, how much should we rate it on? Seven years, not 20. This board and the city council has not approved any projects outside of seven years. So we should really limit what we're doing. And then finally, um, when it comes to low-income projects, there's a reason why those incentives were there. We want to build those kind of things. Let's not throw that out in the discussion about these. Please keep it fair. Please keep it equitable. And please give hard considerations to what the group came up with out of the mayor's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ben Stuckert. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the time that you spend on the Planning Commission. And congratulations to the Planning Commission and Spencer uh, for leading the way across Washington State reimagining what single family zoning can be. Um, I'm just going to upfront say I agreed with everything that Darren said, and I'm going to agree with everything that Jim Frank says. They've presented multiple times to our uh, consortium and all of the issues from one single zone to whatnot. But I'm going to talk about low income housing for a bit here. Uh, I represent the Low Income Housing Consortium, which is 25 agencies that build, design, finance, and believe in affordable housing for everybody in Spokane. Low income housing is different than other residential and commercial buildings. Rent levels are set by the federal government, and we cannot raise rents if local connection fees increase. We are asking for the waiver for low income housing projects that have been in place since last year to continue in full. Without this waiver, Cinto Commons would have had $400,000 more in extra costs, and their developer said it would not have been built yet. It's housing 80 people in Spokane right now. The current project that Jonathan Malahan mentioned is River Haven, and it has over $20 million. It is fully funded 100%. This would add $1.2 million that we have no idea how it would pay for this project it would not get off the ground and that 20 million would go to waste. Our consortium builds an average of 200 to 250 units a year, but some years it's lower than this. It's not a huge difference to the system as a whole, but it's huge to us and it will put us out of protection in the city of Spokane. The city incentive is proposing a partial waiver and proposing in the documents I've seen to use our local levy dollars, House Bill 1590, to do this. A partial waiver of 60000 when those fee increases will cost between 400000 and $1.2 million are not enough to serve any purpose. It's meant to cons $1590, our local levy dollars, are the only local levy dollars available for low-income housing. And all state and federal dollars require matching funds from local jurisdictions. Using that for this instead of the purpose when this passed in 2020, was to build new units, not pay for new fees and substitute them. And you may be asking, well, if we give a full waiver, we're just passing the buck down the road and somebody else is going to have to find the money. I was on council for eight years. And if we have 250 new clients, you can segregate those 250 new low-income clients every year and say that their utility revenue will pay for those waivers in the past. That is an entirely legal, documented, financial way to go. So the new users that don't exist <coughs> in the system now and won't exist if you increase these fees will exist with the waiver, and that new revenue can pay for that. There's nothing in the law, 1326, that passed that says you have to replace it. It leaves it very wide open for what revenue you replace it for. You can do a one-time rate increase that would move forward annually, so it would be just one time, and it'd pay for those waiver increases. Or we can continue to work with the state on the CHIP funds, which exist now for connection fees, and come up with a policy and a plan so that the city gets paid back. But I'm just saying there are options, and so if you give low-income housing the full waiver, don't feel like you're kicking it down the road. 
but we're asking for a full waiver for low-income housing and do not use and recommend, please, as a planning commission, not to use our only local source of funds, the 1590 funds. I also just, and how much time do I have? You got about 10 seconds. 10 seconds. The single waiver we fee. We need the little thing the, here. The, the disparity between the rich areas of our town and the poor areas of town are going to destroy all the work you've done on racial disparity because nobody's going to build infill on the far out or South Hill or Five Mile, and it's going to have the boomerang effect on the policies you guys are trying so hard to affect. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Sarah Lickfield. Yeah, good afternoon. Thanks for your service on the Planning Commission and for listening to our testimonies today. My name is Sarah Lickfold. I work as the Executive Director at Transitions, a nonprofit that works to end poverty and homelessness for women and children in Spokane. We are a member of the Spokane Low Income Housing Consortium. As you've probably heard, Spokane is in a housing crisis. We need every kind of housing. However, we as low income housing providers feel this acutely as we try to find affordable housing for people experiencing homelessness or who are on the cusp of homelessness. We continually receive calls for help from women living in their cars with their children, women who are camping out, families fleeing domestic violence, and people looking for resources to stay housed. And continually, our housing is full, and it remains full because there are so few places for our participants to find quality, affordable housing. Our community needs to do whatever it takes to support the construction of affordable housing projects. Adding barriers like GFCs or taking what money we do have from 1590 funds will stifle affordable housing projects and our community cannot afford to do that. I urge you to provide a GFC waiver for affordable housing projects, I should say a full one, without using the 1590 funds to pay for the waiver. I understand that the law requires those waivers to be paid by something or someone, and we've mentioned some options, including CHIP funds, um, using the, those additional rate, uh, the base rate and utility taxes paid by those new low-income housing uh, facilities, or recommend a one-time very small increase on rate payers for the sake of affordable housing. We already can't build enough affordable housing to make up for increased housing costs and inflation, construction costs, et cetera. Please don't limit us any further. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Next is Amy Manning. Hi, thank you for, for listening to us and thank you for serving on this committee. We really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Amy Manning, and I also I work for SLIC, uh, Spokane Low Income Housing Consortium. I work on the Row Project, which is locally known as Camp Hope, and I've worked in housing and homelessness for 22 years. I, um, I served on the mayor's uh, GFC commission, and um, like what Darren said, a lot, we had a lot of good conversations, and there was a pretty wide range of people in the room uh, that brought up some really good good points and uh, uh, we're not really seeing them on what the staff has recommended. So I'm just gonna kind of revisit some of those things that uh, from my purview uh, in that room seemed like we had consensus on. And uh, the first one was uh, one um, zone was really, uh, we mold that over quite a bit and it really is an equity issue in Spokane. The way that the, the two zones fit as Ben said and as Darren said like we will not see infill in the neighborhoods that have traditionally been redlined and so work that we've done to change the way that our community looks and to have mixed income mixed um, demographics and neighborhoods is not going to change uh, with a one zone um, or with a two zone uh, reflecting those historic red line districts. And that was something that we came to a pretty good consensus on um, in that uh, committee. And uh, the waiver for low income housing was also something that we uh, didn't have a lot of time to discuss because what we didn't know about this new um, law that was going to come into effect that was gonna require the backfilling. So 
we were pretty much reassured in that room that that low-income housing waiver would continue so that in a housing crisis, we would have good, um, good ways to continue to uh, serve the folks in our community. Um, we also talked a lot about ERUs and MCEs, more than I really uh, had a lot of interest in before I was in that room, frankly. <laughs> but the, the sense and the recommendations at the end of that were really, uh, I think Brooke and folks came up with kind of a, a compromise between the MCEs and ERUs, uh, utilizing the, the number of uh, like faucets and that kind of thing to count that. Uh, as a more equitable thing because the MCEs really have a wide range and you're kind of punishing folks that are producing smaller, uh, the smaller end of uh, group housing. Again, MCEs and ERUs, very uh, thick stuff, but the MCEs, as far as uh, folks in that room, did not seem like a fair way to do, especially infill um, housing. And then, um, just, uh, you know, as somebody who was in the tents at Camp Hope with the 470 people, like this is, this, these decisions that we're making right now are going to affect how, like all the way down the road. Like in the last 10 years in Spokane, we've been sitting at between a 2% and 1% vacancy rate. And while we see that as people who are chronically homeless, there are so many people in our community that are just on the edge of homelessness. And if we don't start to make some inroads on the housing production, especially for low-income housing, uh, this is not going to, we're not gonna be able to see that alleviate for our, for our families here. Am I over? Nope. Okay. Perfect. Right on. Thank you. <laughs> Andrew, you know, Andrew, I can never get your name. Uh, Lou Rawls, we're not related, but uh, Rawls, Rawls. <laughs> All right, well thank you, uh, Commission President and Commissioners. I'm Andrew Rawls with uh, the Downtown Spokane Partnership, and, uh, and I will likewise reiterate uh, comments that we've shared with uh, staff and, uh, uh, over the course of the process. We were uh, concurrently members of the Mayor's Commission, uh, our Mayor's Committee on uh, General Facilities Charges, and uh, over the course of that time, um, you know, we, we developed a good bit of understanding of, of how it would affect uh, downtown, particularly, and and uh, and our recommendations are, are based on uh, discussions with with developers uh, here in downtown. Um, our overall guiding uh, principle was to, as as you're hearing from uh, everyone else tonight, to to contain costs as much as possible, uh, and and I believe uh, our recommendations do that for. Um, uh, circumstances that are very particular to downtown. Beginning with uh, no surprise interest, we recommended that uh, interest not be retained uh, in the calculations. It's a marginal cost, but it's a marginal cost. But uh, again, uh, as to the bottom line, and, and keeps projects in downtown viable as it would elsewhere. Uh, with respect to the uh, ERU versus MCE debate, um, you know, I, I think we took a little bit different of a tack and. Uh, prior to further uh, discussion at the meetings, I think we were going to uh, definitely support ERU um, on the basis of ease of understanding for developers. Uh, but as we got further into the discussion, it, it seemed to us that uh, using the uh, meter capacity equivalency method would be advantageous in circumstances that we hope to see more of in downtown, uh, which, uh, which is uh, commercial to residential conversions. Uh, it's our understanding that the advantages found um, uh, in only requiring the developer to pay for the difference in cost over the existing meter type, uh, whereas the ERU method might come at a somewhat higher cost. Again, it's uh, like with interest, it's a marginal difference, so we, we ultimately we support uh, uh, whatever is determined to be the lower cost method. Uh, we did support a, a, as lengthy of a phase-in process as possible. We suggested a five-year phase-in. I, I think staff recommended a three. So, uh, again, all intended to cushion the impact of these quite significant fees uh, and keep development as uh, feasible as possible in downtown and across the city. And then uh, with respect to the single versus uh, uh, upper ver uh, and lower zone uh, discussion, uh, in principle, we support, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, 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 lower and upper uh, zone uh, structure, uh, 
because downtown is in proximity uh, to the resources that uh, that, that the system uh, distributes. Uh, it is in proximity to sources of water for our water and wastewater system. Uh, it's obviously not economically advantage, uh, advantageous for downtown uh, to fund the pumps and reservoirs necessary to elevate water to the periphery of the city when those resources originate uh, here and, in, and next to downtown. Additionally, a significant maintenance or, um, uh, or, excuse me, although many of the systems that transport water and wastewater to downtown's buildings are due for significant maintenance or replacement, our understanding is that those costs would be covered through utility fees and not through general facilities charges, uh, which fund new infrastructure. That said, we're not, in, uh, uh, we're not opposed to a single rate zone, so long as downtown is either carved out of the GFC uh, fee structure altogether, uh, or significant incentives which recognize downtown's proximity to that infrastructure is implemented. That leads me to the, my final comment, which is on incentives. Uh, we support applying incentives for general, for general facilities charges to the MFTE program. You saw a reference to that, I think, uh, in staff's report. Um, and to any other reasonable program that, incentives, uh, that incentivizes preferred types of development. Um, in our meetings with staff, we spoke specifically in support of a program that came to an end in 2019. It was the commercial rate uh, class clarification program. Uh, our board endorsed uh, reestablishing that program, and we, subsequent to that meeting, uh, met with staff, and uh, it was about an hour-long meeting. We talked about that in, in principle, and uh, they indicated that they were uh, working through uh, that concept and, 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 and considering uh, bringing it back. Ten more seconds. But it didn't, uh, it didn't, it seems like it didn't make it up onto the slide that you saw a few minutes ago. So, uh, with that, uh, again, we are not opposed at the moment, but... Uh, Given the final shape, we, we may have to head that route. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Chris Baden. Welcome, former commissioner. <laughs> Thank you. It's glad to be back. Thank you, uh, Plan Commission. Um, I, my name is Chris Batten with Rencorp Realty, and I am a, a member of the Downtown Spokane Partnership Board of Directors. Um, we were involved in the committee, and it seems like a lot of the uh, recommendations from the committee um, haven't made it through uh, staff. Um, and I think when we talk about consensus, consensus really is about debate and, and disagreement and agreement. Where can you find consensus? Because there were all sorts of different, you know, perspectives. Um, when you look at it from a downtown perspective, I think Andrew covered it really clearly, you know, MCE, uh, you know, lower zone, um, and affordability incentives. Those are three of the things that I think we, we felt really strongly about. But as you looked at the whole group, we could easily say, you know, we're okay with a, a citywide zone. We're, we're okay with ERUs, okay? But downtown ultimately should be exempt. If for no other reason, and Andrew mentioned it, is the facilities for downtown are already here and GFCs are re you know, required that, you know, those funds be used for in infrastructure and facilities, not maintenance and management. We pay maintenance and management through our utility bills. Um, you know, that's, I think that's the logical, you know, uh, debate for downtown should not should be exempt. But I think the, the practical debate is when you look at downtown, the current state of downtown, where we're going and what downtown might look like in 10 years, we desperately need more housing downtown. And, you know, one of the ways to do it isn't to add on additional fees that maybe aren't justified. And downtown has always been exempt. And it's just one more thing to layer in. Now, we understand that, you know, existing... Uh, infrastructure in, in buildings that are already there, that that will play into it. We also know that fire sprinkler lines will play into that as well. But when we start looking at underutilized surface parking lots, we, it's one of the things we want to do the most. We have, you know, we want to build on those. So we're now creating a disincentive to build on one of the hardest things to build on downtown. And I'll tell you, downtown, if it's not 10x more expensive to build, I can tell you the land acquisition costs alone are, are 20, 30, 40 times more expensive to build downtown. You know, we have the infrastructure, we have mass transit, we need density and infill downtown, and this is just one more thing that's gonna add cost to downtown. So regardless of whether we go with a single zone, ERU, MCE, um, I believe that downtown should otherwise be exempt for those reasons. And I would also say that, you know, one thing I think there was broad consensus on was the fact that low-income housing should be excluded and that was tied back to the MFTE, more or less, that 12-year period with MFTE. If you were on that MFTE program, the 12-year program, that you should otherwise be exempt. And I think that was 
across the board, everybody agreed on that. So I would say, my personal opinion, if, if we have to get a one-time rate bump for everybody to accommodate that, then I think that's, that's probably the approach to go if that's how we have to pay for it. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Thomas. Hello. Well, I echo the sentiments of many of the people who were on um, the mayor's uh, GFC uh, committee with myself. Uh, I'm from Spokane Home Builders Association. Uh, every 100 homes that are built infuse the local economy with $9.4 million during construction and $2 million each year after construction. New development not only generates fees from general facility charges, but fund growth-related capital projects. Um, it also is a sign of a significant thriving economy. If well-meaning yet short-sighted policies are put into place that create a disincentive to build in parts of Spokane, it will be to the long-term detriment of the community. <clears throat> We're in a significant, uh, we, Spokane Home Builders Association, is a um, stakeholder group with over 800 members representing the residential building industry. And um, like many of the people who were on the committee with me, we feel that the consensus of the committee was not necessarily represented by staff. So I wanted to clear up a few of those things. And I brought a copy of a position statement that I can leave with you or email to you. With zones, we believe that there should only be one fee district. This was the consensus of the committee. Two fee zones unfairly burden projects located on the South Hill. Additionally, if there are two zones, I would highly recommend that you specify that the fees that are collected in the upper zone stay in the upper zone. Otherwise, I think that you could wind up with a situation like you have in Lataw Valley, where fees that were collected well, in the South District um, were used primarily on South Hill and not in Lataw Valley. So um, to specify that fees collected in the upper zone would only stay in the upper zone. But we're proponents of one zone, um, as was the committee as a whole. Interest, we believe, as the committee did, that interest expenses should be removed as a re recoverable cost during um, in calculating the fees. The Spokane County Sewer capacity. We believe that the portion of the capacity sold to the Spokane County should be fairly reflected in the cost calculations. The staff discussed in one of our meetings that they had erroneously dealt with the 20 percent of the sewer capacity sold to. I keep hearing an extra voice. I'm like, is that just a voice in my head? <laughs> um, sold to the Spokane County. The sewer system recoverable cost should be reduced by the cost basis of the portion of the system sold to Spokane County, and, and this has not been done yet. Uh, MCEs versus ERUs. We believe that the fee should be based on an ERU system rather than meter size. That is because the fee should be fair and based off of actual use. The committee shared a concern that fees based on meter size only did not actu accurately represent the actual sewer and water use of an applicant. And even though there's not that significant of a difference when it comes to water with MCEs or ERUs with sewer, there's a 7.2% difference. And I think that if you ask a future home buyer if 7.2% is important to them and it's several thousand dollars, that that's significant. So if we can, um, like Chris Patton said, choose the, the lowest cost method, that's our recommendation. Phase in, we believe that if the fees are based upon a fair and equitable allocation of system costs, that a phase-in would not be necessary. The focus should be on developing a, a fair GFC fee, not trying to mitigate the short-term impacts and incentives. The committee's consensus, um, as is Spokane Home Builders Associations, is that fees should be waived for permanently affordable housing. The lack of the fee waiver will make many subsidized projects economically unfeasible in many cases. Trying to find a reimbursement fund will not be economically feasible without taking from affordable housing funds. And to be clear, if there's no funding identified, then there will be no waivers even offered. So it will be really important to make sure that as the update for GFCs is passed that you have a funding stream in place for those waivers for affordable housing. Thank you so much. Thank you. That is all I have uh, for public testimony. Do we have any additional public testimony from some, anyone that hasn't testified yet? 
I thought you might, Mr. Frank. Welcome, Jim Frank. You're muted. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the work that the Planning Commission is doing on this project. It, this, is a com this is a very complicated issue, um, one that uh, I've dealt with now for almost a full year. Um, I was on the uh, Mayor's Advisory Committee as well as many of the other people who testified. And I do agree that um, the, uh, the conversations and the comments and the ideas that came out of the committee have not been fairly reflected in the staff reports that have been given. I'd like to, I mean, this is so complicated with four minutes, there's not very much time to talk about the complexity, but there are two or three things I'd like to highlight. Um, one relates to the issue of one, uh, one fee area or two. It's important to understand how that was calculated. And in the calculation that the, that the staff and their consultant went through when they established the two fee areas, they used a different baseline assumption for how much water a use in for that one MCE or one ERU would be using. So they assumed that a, a one MCE or one ERU would use about 1,650 gallons of water a day in the upper zone. And in the lower zone, they would use only about 1,100 or 1,050 gallons a day. So they made that assumption based on historic water use in those pressure zones. The city measures the water consumption by pressure zone. And that's a historical artifact, really. It reflects the fact that in the low pressure zones in neighborhoods like West Central, for example, all the houses are small and they're on small lots, so they don't use as much water. But once you go up into the South Hill, you start to get houses that were built later in time. They, they were built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And so you have houses that are a little bit larger and they're on larger lots and so they're using more water. But that is irrelevant really to the amount of water consumption that a new use will use. A new use is going to use the same amount of water whether it's located in the upper zone or the lower zone. But if Habitat is to build a small 1,200 square foot house in the upper zone, they're going, to, they're going to automatically be assumed to use twice as much water if, as if they built that same unit in, in what was designated as a lower zone. So that's just a flawed assumption, in my opinion, that was made. And there's no rational way to justify that. The, the boundaries were also manipulated. So you'll find, when you look at the map, you'll find about a 250-acre parcel on, on uh, Nevada, and, and that, uh, that parcel is a vacant land parcel. It was included in the upper zone, even though it's completely surrounded by the lower zones actually in the North Hill zone. So um, there's not a lot of assumptions were made when they, when they established those boundaries that um, were not, um, um, they, they're, they're, they created inequities, and, and for that reason alone, I think there needs to be a single zone. I'd also like to talk about the, the ERUs and the MCEs. And the ERUs, um, and this is... Uh, you have about 30 the, seconds. The ERUs, um, well, I'm... Uh, I, I've said in my comments, um, I sent had it in written comments, and so I'll just rely um, on my written comments for the balance, uh, other than to say that the adjustment for the Spokane County purchase of the sewer capacity has not been properly reflected. The staff and the consultant removed the amount of money that the county paid for that system, but that doesn't reflect the cost that's, that was incurred in developing that system and so the cost basis is not been adjusted properly, uh, in my opinion. So um, 
I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any additional public testimony? Okay, hearing none, I'm city as the applicant here, uh, Catherine or Marlene, do you want to add anything based upon what you heard from public testimony? I just wanted to, to clarify that from our perspective, the committee didn't come up with a single consensus. I think you've heard from a lot of folks today, which was very helpful to get their positions, which I think they're accurately reflecting the positions that we heard from them. I'm not suggesting otherwise, but, but missing, for example, is the community assembly representative, Molly Marshall, who also supported two zones versus one zone. Um, so, I, I mean, there's a couple things. We had that chart for you last week, so I would encourage you to also look at that because, I mean, I, th I think consensus was difficult for us because there were people who had very different views so you know there might have been a bulk that agreed with one thing but I don't know that consensus is necessarily the right word so uh, that would be um, the only clarification there um, I did want to point out that we do have that chart for MCEs around plumbing considerations that we went over with you so I don't know I think I think what Amy's reflecting is kind of the discussion we had around MCEs could accommodate so a certain meter size can accommodate so many fixtures like bathtubs and toilets and sprinkler heads and those kinds of things so so we we have that chart and we will finalize that chart so that planning staff can use that or developer services staff can use that when people come in to select what kind of meter size is available to them. So we tried to make that as, as easy as possible. Um, also, that remember the differential on the, the sewer rate on ERU versus MCE is because our ERU rate on sewer is an estimate at this point until we do that larger study around inflow from groundwater. So I just wanted to clarify those things. We would not recommend using an ERU model on the sewer side until we can complete that study. So if you go with a, an ERU approach, we would um, recommend that you adopt the MCE model on the sewer side for now and allow us to complete the additional work. So that was the only couple things I wanted to add. Thank you. Did you have anything to add? No. Chair? Sure. Is it appropriate to ask a question of the proponent based off the testimony? Well, as we get into liberations, we can call them back up. Okay, thanks. Okay, at this point, I'm, I am going to close the hearing, and so we can... Testimony. Public testimony. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I was going to say, huh? I'll, so I'll close something. I, <laughs> yes, I will close public testimony so we can begin our discussion, uh, and we're going to start that discussion with a motion, and then we'll kind of work from there. So what we kind of figured out, or what we're starting with on a motion, is to basically incorporate everything that uh, staff suggested based upon the original ordinance that was passed in March, and then all the changes they're recommending, and then we can make amendments to that as necessary. Okay? I forgot what to say. <laughs> I'd move that we recommend the approval to the general facility charges as written and presented and as previously adopted in ordinance C36372, but with the addition of a 5 8 inch water meter option, the updated sewer charge, a phase in of fees over two years, the clarification of master meter charges as presented, clarification of the ENR index use, and the adoption of the recommended development incentives. <coughs> Thank you, Commissioner Patterson. I can second. Thank you, Commissioner Bayreuther. So we have a first and a second, and so at this point we can begin deliberations. I'll, maybe I'll ask that question then. So, um, so ERU versus MC, I had raised a question in the, in the workshop about fire suppression, and I think it was adequately explained that that the capacity for fire, you know, suppression is, is not included. It's, it's the size of the meter is actually, or, or the fee is based off of what the calculated size would need to be. Um, so, but now I'm, I, I think I need a little clarification on 
how that might be perceived differently in ERU versus MCE, because to me that's more of an ERU approach where it's a theor it's not a theoretical, it's a calculated capacity for the meter size. Um, so if, if I only need five ace because of my calculated usage, but I actually need a three quarter or one inch for the for the fire scenario. Um, yes, I get I have to pay for a bigger physical meter, but the fee reflects five A's. But that doesn't actually, again, back to my questions about usage, it, if, I have a, if I have a three quarter inch meter, then I'm, I can use more water, right? I'm not physically restricted from doing that. I would pay for it as a rate payer, but, but it kind of breaks down that argument of, you know, you know of, of trying to go to that smaller capacity. So my question is, is ERU versus MC does one, is one more appropriate for a calculated capacity? To me, it seems the ERU is. Yeah, can we get someone to answer that question? And maybe it'd also just be helpful to understand, am I wrong on the fire suppression that a three quarter or one inch line, you know, because this does come up in the life safety codes from ADUs and so forth that we're moving towards three quarter and one inch line. Yeah, I don't know that I have a specific response to that. Is Brooke, are you still on? I think she's hung up. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, in most cases, a single family home wouldn't have fire suppression systems. Um, maybe in certain cases they would. Um, when it's a separate fire meter, it's a, it's a little easier to sort of have that conversation, but I don't know that I'm adequately prepared to answer that question. That's a, and that's fair, thank you. And, 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 you know, I will say that as we get into life safety codes and we move more towards middle housing typologies, that we are moving towards fire, uh, fire suppression. So I think it is a concern of mine that we get into row houses and so forth and there's debates on fire suppression and even IRC, you know, type structures. Um, but thank you. On, on the um, ERU side, the equivalent residential unit, um, much that was presented, the basis for the low system at ERU is um, assumed to be 1,100 gallons per, per day. Mm -hmm. So you might need a two inch meter simply for the fire system, but the calculation would assume that it's 1,100 gallons per day for residential use. Um, that ERU model then would be extrapolated out by how many units you're building. Uh, much in a PUD, uh, they have one large meter with 25 houses in that PUD. Each house pays an ERU. Um, on the meter capacity size, uh, we, we, we had the chart in one of the presentations on how many fixture units could be fed through a uh, specific size meter. Um, on a 5 8 inch meter, that was 25 fixture units. So you could have one apartment with 25 fixture units that's e equal to a 5 8 inch meter. Um, if you had multiple apartments and it's 400 fixture units, um, they would need a two inch meter for domestic use, even though they might actually have to have a six inch meter because there's a fire hydrant or fire suppression in the building. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, both methods, it's, it's about a 1.2% difference in flow uh, when, when you extrapolate ERU versus MCE. Um, they're, they're figured out to about 1.1 gallon per minute. So you could, on very large commercial, that's how we would ex uh, exchange that, is the gallons per minute need for domestic use based on the fixture counts. Right. Okay. That's, it's very informative, thank you. I just don't know if I personally yet understand which method is better to accommodate you know, the fire suppression capacity, knowing that that's not part of the, of the, the fee. It, it, it is, it, it, yes, it is very uh, confusing. And it, it could, um, there's also a, was one of the slides in the presentation that showed this tier step. Because um, you can take a one inch meter and you can feed four uh, duplexes with that one inch meter. 
Um, or if you were paying ERU at that four duplexes, you'd pay higher in an ERU model um, versus the MCE model. Yeah. Um, but at the lower number, of, it, it all depends on the number of units you're building versus that meter. Once you start maxing out the meter capacity, then you're actually doing better off of the MCE side than the ERU. At the beginning of the meter capacity, you're better off on the ERU side. So okay. It's all dependent on the exact development that you're working on. Yeah. Thank you very much. That, that's helpful. And I'll, I'll conclude here and, and let others speak. But I think, you know, it, it's unusual, of course. And I think, you know, Ben Stuckert, you know, mentioned that we should state that normally we wouldn't, we wouldn't review and make recommendations on something that's not in Title 17. This was a special request. Uh, and, and so I'm also, because we're a plan commission, looking for what those other potential connections are and should be to zoning. So it's not, not trying to get us deep into the technicalities of the water supply and the fixture count and so forth, you know, that normally aren't, you know, coming before this commission. But, but I'm specifically looking for how does this tie into our densification or intensification of, of our, our neighborhoods? How does it relate to infill? How are benefits and incentives based off of that? I don't see that in here now. I don't think they are in there. They, we have MC, you know, we have other incentives, but it's not based on something specific to creating density and, and higher utilization of our, our, our infrastructure. So, and I don't want to discourage fire suppression because that is part of this densification that as we do more attached housing, more middle housing typing plexes and so forth, fire suppression is really critical. And I know that's also an ADU, ADU consideration that we should not forget about. So thank you. Yes, Commissioner Winger. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I had a question concerning the uh, two zones. Um, is that first part of that, is that map set in stone? Uh, what I see in the package is uh, up there at uh, Lincoln and, and Crestline uh, was mentioned by some testimony and also looks like maybe out by Minnehaha is a high zone, but the area surrounding them isn't. Uh, so I was just wondering, you know, how we were told earlier in workshops that it was because of height and some of these don't appear to be because of height. So is it because of piping that has to be uh, built to get to those places or something else? Those, those areas uh, up at Lincoln and out, out by Minnehaha, um, out by the Valley Costco, uh, those areas are not actually part of our low pressure zone. So the white map is part of the low pressure zone in our current system. We don't have any pipe there right now. Okay. Should it actually get developed out in those areas, it would be served by, many, uh, Lincoln is North Hill pressure zone. That would in, then become part of the North Hill pressure zone then being the low, pre, uh, low tier, zone one. Um, it is, it is a uh, byproduct of the way the GIS is drawn currently. They're just not part of any pressure zone right now. Pipe goes in, it would be part of the low, uh, the, the low tier. Thank you. So are you saying then if GFCs are charged on those locations that they would be charged the lower zone rate? Yes, yes, they would be. Um, it, it, would be it would not be physically possible to feed them from a higher zone. They would be part of the load fee zone. Okay. Those, those two areas, only, only on the northeast portion right there, um, by, by Lincoln and down by the river on the east portion of the city limits. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Neely first. Um, uh, Mr. President, I'd like to um, amend the motion currently on the floor. Can I do that? Yes. I'd like to amend the motion currently on the floor to include the following. Um, that the motion be amended to include only one fee district instead of two, uh, to eliminate interest expenses from the fee calculations, 
um, that the fee rate be based on ERU, uh, that we phase in the GFC costs, and that we keep any and all incentives on affordable housing. Those are my suggested amendments to the motion currently on the floor. I would suggest breaking those up into separate amendments because the amendment okay. by itself will be probably too complex to deliberate. Agreed. Um, can, we, can we assume that those are five suggested amendments as read, or do I? We have to do one at a time. Yeah, go ahead and just start with your first one, and then we'll work from there. Okay, and then first amendment forward. would be that the, the um, motion currently on the floor be amended to uh, to advocate only one fee district citywide. Second. We have a second from Commissioner yeah, one Bayreuther. Zone. One, one zone. One zone. One zone. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so the amendment on the floor at this point is to move from two zones to a single zone. And we have a first from Commissioner Neely and a second from Commissioner Bayreuther. Now, I'll just say, you know, I'm kind of split on this because I believe that the upper zone should pay more, you know, because of the extra infrastructure required there. But the disparity between the two zones is so substantial, I really have problems with that. I mean, I, I know that there's a higher cost there, but it's also, you know, by a factor of almost three or four above. And that makes it really challenging to, you know, you have that on one side of the street, you have lower zone, and then the next side of the street, you have upper zone, and that disparity is so high, I do think it would discourage development in the upper zone. Um, and, but also from a perspective of, we need to pay for the infrastructure somehow, I, I have some concerns about the lower zone subsidizing the costs for the upper zone. So that's just my statement, so. I guess I, I'm also torn because I, I'll, there were, in previous systems, there were incentives for developing a more housing in a dense, closer to downtown areas. It included downtown and included some land surrounding downtown and two zones would sort of emulate that incentive, but with one zone, there would be no incentive then to, for development to stay closer to downtown. Um, even on a per unit basis, it could, you know, it could even discourage um, denser development in areas where we have other services that can more be easily um, pay for themselves by utilizing existing services like transit. I agree, though, that there would be a substantial disincentive to develop in especially the South Hill. I was surprised to see that, man, when I ride my bike up north, it seems like I'm going up a real steep hill and somehow it's all still in the lower zone. Um, but I trust the, the math on the water pressure zones. Um, my only thing that makes me feel a little better is that there that some infill development and some conversion of existing properties on the South Hill um, and other upper zone areas could mitigate that cost for some development, but that would be limited by properties that have existing water meters. So I would love for someone to convince me that one is better than the other. Commissioner Williams first. I support uh, one zone primarily for the fact that uh, we will drive up the cost of housing in what are generally upper income areas. And we'd, I think it's important to encourage a diversity of, of housing and uh, income uh, levels throughout the city. And it's still one city, so from my perspective, uh, one rate is fair and consistent, uh, simpler to administer. Uh, recommended by a number of people on the committee, as I understand it. So I'm, I'm very much in support of one zone. Mr. Mayor. 
I'll try to convince you, and I, I, I agree, and that's the exact w w phrase I was going to say, is we're, we're one city. Um, I've said this before. We're one big pool. Someone pees in the pool. We're all responsible for it. And that decision, that responsibility, in my opinion, is covered when the city council sets the boundaries, when they annex an area and so forth. And so um, I, I, I can't find an equitable model that's not, it's all, a, it's one responsibility, one system that we have to, have to address. Um, I, I think if there is a more surgical approach, then it should be on the incentive side and the waivers, not on, not on the base fee. Commissioner Winger. Uh, for the other side of the argument, I'm for two zones for several reasons. First reason is uh, almost all of District 1 is in the, the lower zone, and that's the poorest area in the state. Uh, also, east side, uh, some of the lower areas of District 3 are also in there. And it's also closer to the center of the city. So for an equity issue, I think uh, two zones is better. Most of the properties included in the high zone are more expensive properties. And so the differential uh, is fair because the piping is further. Also because uh, the people are going to be driving further. So they're going to put more pressure on other parts of our infrastructure aside from plumbing. Uh, the other uh, reason for doing it is uh, I believe that uh, we want to infill in the center of the city more than the exterior. And having uh, Indian Trail and Five Mile on the north side and the lower south or the upper south hill, which is more south, uh, would cause us to expand in areas that we don't want to. So we would be putting more economic incentives towards center city rather than outside in the periphery. So those would be my two reasons for going with two zones to improve uh, construction in areas that would require less infrastructure and to be more equitable. Commissioner Neely, then Mary. Okay. Um, I'd like to go along with the, the voices who say we are one city. I will stand shoulder to shoulder with my brothers and sisters across the city and assume they will do the same for me. And we live in a country right now that is too divided. And the idea, as, as our president suggested, that we might end up with, with people on one side of the street paying one rate and people on the other side of the street paying the other, um, whether that's actually a physical reality, the point is still clear. Um, one city, we all pull um, together and let the market decide where it wants to build. Mary. Uh, yeah, um, I'd like to Can you use your microphone? Oh. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, sorry. Um, I'd like to underscore that the community assembly uh, requested uh, or suggested two d districts instead of one. And I what I'd like to understand is, or that make sure everybody understands, is if you go to one district, then the cost of those booster stations gets shared in District mm -hmm. 1 and some of the lower areas where it's closer to the city and it's going to raise the price of District 1 somewhat in order to alleviate the cost of District 2. So I, I think there is a reason for two and <clears throat> two districts, and I uh, support what the community assembly said. Yes. So I um, respectfully wanted to disagree with using engineering and infrastructure as a planning mechanism. I think we, we fall into this. We fell into it, the traffic impact fees. We say how we're going to control growth. In my opinion, that's called zoning and land use and not, you know, specifically should be tied to engineering. Now, you have to provide infrastructure to in enable growth, but I don't think that has to be but in, in terms of using different impact fees to, to do that. We, we can do that again, surgically with the fees by waivers and benefits, and then focus on planning and for our growth management. Commissioner Winger. Uh, just clarification, this is a one-time hookup charge, correct? Okay. Yes. At this point, 
we haven't been presented with many options for incentives. The only, I mean, obviously we could potentially recommend other incentives and it would be up to the city council to consider and implement additional incentives, um, which I would say if we were to recommend one zone should be a consideration, not only just for the downtown core, but for the other areas that would significantly benefit from higher density by reducing overall infrastructure costs. Um, again, not just plumbing, but also streets and roads and transit and all of the other things that um, have already been put in place. Um, and I, I guess my concern is that those incentives just may never come. <laughs> because also there's no funding for them. Any further comments or discussion before we vote on the amendment? Okay. Uh, just a voice vote on whether or not to pass this amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. I guess me too. Okay, so motion passes four to two. Mr. President, my next um, motion is to eliminate interest expenses from the fee calculations. I second. Commissioner Neely first and Commissioner Winger second on eliminating interest rate. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. From the um, I agree with the comments that were made earlier in the, in the public testimony about um, the variability of, of interest expenses. Uh, and I think um, we're going to we're going to have a more level playing field in terms of the uh, true dollars and cents of those fee calculations if we eliminate uh, the cost of money. Thank you, Mr. President. Other comments on this? Commissioner Winger. Well, I feel that because we've been behind the curve on this, these fees are pretty high and as a amelioration of, of lowering the fee slightly, I think the interest should be uh, not put in because we want to build more housing units. I'm actually going to take the opposite approach because I think that the interest rates encourages the city to invest more in building out the infrastructure up front and that that ultimately gets paid back over time. So now how... That's just my interpretation of the whole thing. I'm, rather than building for the short term, they can ultimately build more for the long term. I think the changing in uh, moving to a one zone already does a substantial amount to reduce the cost on the what was the upper zone. Uh, it will certainly increase the cost in the lower zone area. Um, but I am not going to support the removal of the interest rates. We have Commissioner Patterson first. Uh, I'm not sure that my uh, thought either really weighs either direction. I was thinking similarly about building out capacity, but more on the side that there is a minimum capacity. If you're going to build a new water tower, you can't necessarily build a small water tower um, just in the interest of time and the cost of construction. Um, and so although I do appreciate that the opportunity cost of the money, it'd be nice if it could be spent somewhere else or on other things in the current time that sometimes we just have to spend the money now. So I don't know that that necessarily is an argument for paying the interest because 30 years down the road, that money is not going to make a lot of difference, but it does um, ameliorate the um, the cost, that opportunity cost in the short term. Um, so I guess I would support actually keeping the interest um, because it's not going to, it's not, we're not going to build smaller water towers and we have to spend the money. Commissioner Wing. Uh, 
I, I see your point, President Francis. Would you be uh, willing to phase it in and let's say like a five-year plan uh, so that we can get building in the next few years and make a slight savings to improve our, our stuff now? But the point is well taken that the city should plan uh, ahead because it's cheaper to use today's dollars than dollars in five or ten years. Uh, so a phase-in, would that be something that uh, the commission would be willing to look at? My thought is yes. we're already phasing in through the other mechanism, potentially, and so you know, I think we just incorporate it into the calculations from the immediately. A, a clarifying yes. question, and I, I fully admit that I uh, am, um, don't have a deep enough understanding of this topic. So if we get rid of the interest calculation, which makes things simpler, which has some appeal, what does that actually mean then in terms of uh, how the rates are set and, and, the, and the fees? It's, it sounds like you, you could just leave it out, but you still are going to need the same amount of money to build projects. So I don't really quite understand this. What are we... Uh, achieving by uh, taking it out versus leaving it in. So I'm looking for someone who has a little more experience on this to kind of give a layman's explanation. Um. <laughs> I know my own personal belief, but I can't say it with any sort of authority. Is there a someone from the city that could address the, that point? Is the question that th does the base rate get recalculated on that? I mean, it, we've seen the kind of the adjustments to the tables based upon if you t remove the interest. I mean, my interpretation of it is that, you know, there's a carrying or basically the interest is a carrying cost of any additional capacity that was added and that you can't, that the additional interest kind of helps recover that cost over time. It is an opportunity cost. I would, I would call it fuzzy math, personally. It, it feels difficult for me to think about. But I also think about the idea of building a water tower or additional pump capacity that do we build, I can't even speak to the scale of a tank, but do we build a 100,000 gallon tank versus a 150,000 gallon tank and that we're absorbed by investing more in that infrastructure today, we are giving up some other opportunities where that extra cost could have gone for city infrastructure. In return, by adding that carrying cost or that interest to the GFCs, we're encouraging the city to think ahead and invest in that infrastructure up front. That's the way my thinking is going and <laughs> Spencer's looking at me like well, well he's got his hand up no I, um, you have your hand up <laughs> I think you explained it well enough um, unless staff wants to come up and uh, maybe I'll make a stab at, at explaining this too and somebody can jump up and tell me that I don't have any clue either <laughs> um, I, so there's sort of two questions I think the first is the interest the, in the current charges, the interest that would be applied is interest on past projects. So our um, decades ago, we as a city made a decision to invest in certain pieces of infrastructure that had far more capacity than was actually needed for the next several decades. We now have excess capacity in those assets. And so in recognition of the investment that was made in the past, we allow for the interest charge to be included to, um, as a way to sort of pay, our, pay ourselves back for that additional investment. So that's what happened in the past. I think what you're speaking to, and this is where I'm a little more fuzzy, is how would the interest make a difference in the city's decisions to make investments in infrastructure in the future? Because if, if interest cannot be included in the calculation, then there's really no benefit to the city to build additional capacity beyond what it maybe thinks it needs for the short term. That's the point you're trying to make, I think. Correct. Mm -hmm. And um, that as those GFCs are updated, maybe 10 years from now, um, and five years from now, we decide to build a, a 
$10 million project instead of a $5 million project, um, the, the $5 million difference between what we know we need for the short term and what we might need 50 years from now, if without that interest included, there's no, written, there's no way for us to pay ourselves back for that. I think that's the point you're trying to make. Can I get a nod from somebody that's telling me I'm on the right track? Okay, looks like that's reasonably accurate, so. But, it, but it's not totally true that you can't, the city can't capitalize on that because it would now just shift to the rate payers. Is that a fair statement? It's just not coming through the GFCs on the initial. Uh, well, I think what you're suggesting is that that doesn't mean the city can't invest. It's that the money that would that would pay in my you know ten versus five million dollar example, for example, uh, having interest built into the GFCs lets us recover some of that cost in the future. But there are other ways to recover that cost. I think that's what you're suggesting. We could we could take general fund money, or we could get a grant, or there's lots of other ways that we could pay for that additional capacity that don't involve charging ourselves in the future to pay for something that we're building um, above and beyond what our um, anticipated capacity needs are in the short term. And, and I was suggesting simply through the ratepayers, through additional capacity, additional development, additional so forth, right? So yeah, ratepayers is one, yeah. one way, I suppose, that, that could be used. Commissioner Neely, did you have a comment? I say your hand, hand up um, and then down. Yeah, no, I took it. I took it down. But the, um, the the last couple of comments that the secretary made, I think, were very prescient on this comment on this uh, topic. Okay. Any other comments on this before we vote, Commissioner Williams? Uh, the comment that one of the speakers made, uh, Darren Watkins, was just that it's hard to figure out and not. All, it looks like there's a number of other communities that choose not to use this. I think it really kind of comes down to this is a way to collect a little extra money and build more capacity, but I, I, it, it also adds some complexity to the system. So I'm, I'm still wondering if maybe the issue isn't just uh, whether we need to not include interest and then readjust the rates um, a bit. I guess my first thought when hearing the, the concern of complexity complexity on on whose part I mean as far as the developer they're just going to see a different chart yeah. with fees so that's just going to be the fee they won't have to they don't have to do any calculations and it's a one-time thing once a year that the city would do to calculate that interest um, so I, I'm not sure what the concern where the concern of complexity well the the last 10 20 years haven't been very consistent in terms of the administration and then interest, interest rates bounce around a lot. So I'm just. Would you like clarification from staff on calculation <laughs> method? So we actually did, we have a very complicated spreadsheet around these projects. Each project we've actually has a line in the spreadsheet and each project has a date of construction and we've reviewed the interest rate at the time of the construction and applied that for 10 years. So there is a lot of complexity and a lot of work that happened behind the scenes. I can tell you that we talked to several dozen cities in the state of Washington. Every one of them includes interest. The state law says you may include interest. It doesn't require it, but it's part of their calculation method. So if we don't include interest, we're just not collecting as much money, which means more of the responsibility for paying for capacity related projects falls to the ratepayer. Those are decisions, but that's why we included interest and, and that's what state law contemplates. However, it does not require it. So I think I think that is um, that's the question that is sort of before the, the, the commission and the, the review committee certainly looked at that. It would reduce um, the charges for both water and sewer, but it's um, it is something that other cities routinely use. Mary. But uh, since uh, Darren Watkins said we you might need eight other staff members to calculate that, I understand. From what I, I'm understanding, you don't need additional staff for including interest in your calculations. Not at this point. We we have we have the very complicated spreadsheet, and now we'll update that over time. It's a little easier once you have the baseline, right? So as we add new projects, we certainly can do that. But but it, you're not that. laying on additional staff for that interest. Not for that particular thing, no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Any other discussion before we vote? Okay, so what we're voting on is whether or not to remove interest from the GFC calculations. All in favor for removing interest from the calculations, say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. aye. Did you say aye or? You said we're supposed to say nay. You know, you said I, so I figured I'd just go with you. <laughs> you said uh, I, Mr. Commissioner Neely? He did. I, I voted in favor of it, yes. Did okay. Tim, vote? Tim did as well, right? Yes. You voted in okay. favor. So motion passes four to two. Mr. President, my next um, suggested amendment is that the uh, fee should be based on an ERU system rather than on meter size. So, you want to make that as a motion? Yeah, yes, sir. So, state it as a motion. <laughs> the, my, the motion is that uh, the the language be changed in the current motion to reflect that the fees should be based on an ERU system rather than on meter size. Do we have a second? Question? Do you have to? I can second. <laughs> uh, first from Commissioner Neely, second from Commissioner Bayreuther. Uh, question? Does that include both water and sewer? There's, because of the groundwater issue on the on the sewer, um, I would say. Well, I would like to see the ERU uh, work on the sewer go forward. So I think I am saying yes, even though I know, uh, as staff has presented, that the ERU on the sewer side having to do uh, having issues associated with the groundwater. But I think it's I think it's important, and I actually believe ultimately uh, it's more equitable across the city to be based on ERU. So, are you saying that your motion was for both water and sewer? Yes, sir. Okay. You second that then? E yes, I'll I'll maintain the second, and then I will defer. But I have a comment. Go ahead. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I'm okay with this because it's a recommendation to the council and it, it gives a chance for staff to explain to the council what the consequences might be of that and, and ultimately, I know that's passing it to the council, but that's what we're here for. We're here to advise and, and, <laughs> and, and raise questions so that um, they can dig deeper. So I'll, I'll support it. Thank you. This is another one that I've kind of gone back and forth on. I'm, you know, because I, I appreciate the simplicity of the MCE model, uh, but I also appreciate the, the level of accuracy that comes in, particularly as you get up to larger meter sizes where you have such large separations between rates, moving from a one and a half to a two or a three. And so, I will support moving to ERU simply because I do think it creates more accuracy in the actual calculation of potential water usage for a development. Commissioner Williams first. I would uh, support the amendment if it was just for water, but the staff indicated they're not ready to uh, implement it yet for the sewer, so it seems to me uh, they don't have the data, we can't really implement it, so I'm gonna vote against it and then hope that we can uh, re-offer the amendment as water only and then I'd support it. I, th I, think, sure. that, I think that's fair, Commissioner Ed, but um, if I understand it correctly, which it's possible I don't, um, to me this is more of the prescriptive and perform performance pathways here, so it's more based on calculated the engineering, and if I'm wrong on that, then please please correct me, but I think that's very important, and, and it, it's very, I, I don't want to discourage 
building capacity even at the parcel level uh, so that we can plan, people can make good decisions about future growth and future growth can mean adding more units on a given parcel. I'm, I'm really worried about encouraging installing smaller meters you know, and, and making poor investments for growth of the city. And that's both the city level and at the individual level. Now, I'm, if I misunderstand that, please, please help me. Yeah. Go ahead, Commissioner Winger. In the workshops, uh, if I put in a 5 8 and then I put in another unit and I go up to a 3 quarter, I'm only paying the difference between the 5 8 and the 3 quarter. Correct. I guess, in, and on that same thought, um, Either way, a meter has to be installed. So if the fees are charged on behalf of the ERUs, someone's gonna to have to make a decision on what the appropriate sized meter is. Um, and I guess I've actually just talked myself into supporting ERUs for water because my concern was that total capacity be sufficient for a unit and the concern being if that person, they may have only had one sink and they had one dishwasher and they had two sprinkler heads when it was built and that's what it was calculated for the ERU, that at some point they could add on, but the meter will still provide some limitation. Although there are exceptions to that and I understand uh, because not everyone has a single meter. Um, but this is all conceptual, we're all trying to make an assumption based on potential use over decades, and I don't think that there are any easy ways to know 100%. We obviously also want people to use low flow utility, you know, shower heads and toilets and faucets, um, which can impact the actual usage in the future versus when something is built. But I'm not sure that it would make a significant difference, but I do see the potential for especially ultra small units being better served by ERUs. Um, so I do support that. Now the one downside I see to that, and it was something that was called out in either one of the workshops or if someone has say a three quarter inch meter, they add an ADU and you're using the ERU system you're now gonna, even if you have capacity in that three quarter inch meter, you are now gonna pay because you're adding more fixtures. fixtures. Okay. So there is an additional cost to be borne if you are doing an expansion, even if the meter size remains the same. Yeah. So that's the one downside of the ERU, but I don't think it's enough for me to not support ERUs. I, I, I would argue that makes it more accurate and it's the same same methodology as the master meter. You're, yeah. you're installing future capacity and paying for it when you add it, so. So I am gonna make an, propose an amendment to the amendment, which you can do, <laughs> to, uh, I propose amending the original amendment to remove, to keep sewer at MCE. Second. Okay, we have a. First from Commissioner Francis and a second from Commissioner Williams. Any discussion on that? Don't you have to get permission from the original amendment? I would support that, Mr. President. I would too, Dave. I mean the second? Okay. Okay. So we're gonna vote on that little minor amendment. And then we're going to back, go back to the main amendment to move to from MCE to ERU, depending upon what the amendment to the amendment says. So all in favor of remove, retaining MCE for sewer usage, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that amendment passes. So now what we have on the floor is that we would move to the ERU model for water only, and that sewer would re stay at MCE. Any further discussion on that item? 
Okay, hearing none. All in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes, so we have now done that amendment. Mr. President, my next amendment would be to alter the language of the original motion to phase in GFC costs over time. Could you clarify by what you mean to phase in? Um, rather than than having them, uh, as I understand it, sort of uh, the, the, the full difference impacting the city at one date, let's say the, you know, January 1st, that it would be something like half in 2024, the other half in 2025, so as to um, minimize the impact of, of these fees. Um, yeah, so that the, the current population. the current original motion does phase it in over a two year period. It does. Yes. yes. Okay. Then I withdraw that uh, amendment motion, Mr. President. Okay. I missed that one. Uh, my final one is a final motion is that. Um, and I may have missed this one, and if I did, I apologize ahead of time, that the, uh, the motion keep any and all incentives in place for affordable housing. Can you clarify the motion? So, any, I mean, the original motion uh, adopts the incentives as that staff have identified in the the report which is um which is kind of changed now because we've recommending a single zone the original motion had 50 percent or upper zone would pay the lower zone rate for affordable housing and the lower zone would pay 50 percent of the lower zone rate so at this point that's kind of completely out there because going to a one zone system, Maybe. what is it? So mm -hmm. uh, I guess this, what the staff recommendation is no longer really valid with a one, bone, one zone system. So we need to kind of come up with a motion to support that. Uh, uh, can I just add a little additional per perspective on the staff side? So I think it would be perfectly appropriate for plan commission to um, provide a recommendation on incentives. Um, just to be clear, the, um, the proposal that will ultimately be adopted in the city code by council will not, is not anticipated to codify specific incentives as an aspect of city code. Just the city will develop incentives? a program around the incentives that we anticipate to be uh, at least the staff recommendation is what we have presented, but that would be that would be created through essentially an administrative process. It's not something that would need to be codified directly into the code. So I don't know, um, given the change in the the proposal. Uh, like I said, I think if Plan Commission feels the need to provide a recommendation on those incentives, that's totally appropriate the actual shape of the incentives is not going to be part of the ordinance that goes forward to council. So um, for what that's worth, I guess. So would it would be appropriate to, not as part of a motion, but as part of maybe findings of fact to say that we encourage the adoption of incentives to be a part of, I mean, so some sort of incentive structure is included in the um, code? No, the code, the code will just state, uh, we haven't finalized any language, but right. the code would essentially state that this, that city staff can offer incentives, yeah, can offer incentives, but the actual details about the incentives would not, um, would not be listed directly in the code. So I think you could, you could make a recommendation as an amendment to this. I think you could also just include in the findings of fact, a desire for the city to develop those incentives. Um, but at the end of the day, 
there's not going to be a section of code that spells out exactly in great detail what those incentives are going to look like. Well, I will make a motion. <laughs> so I move that uh, to make, amend the original motion to waive 100% of GFC fees for affordable housing projects. Second. Okay, original motion by Commissioner Francis, second by Commissioner Winger. Discussion. Can we do that since uh, Mr. Gardner just said that it's not going to specify the type of incentive, but we're only making a recommendation. Okay. Yeah. I think that would be appropriate. Okay. I missed that part in your motion that it was just a recommendation yeah. of that incentive. Okay. All we do is okay. recommend. Well, so I, yes, <laughs> I know that. <laughs> Commissioner um, Ray So thank you for the explanation. I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, so you're saying it's only administrative that there's authority within the departments to define those incentives. Um, but I don't understand why, well, if, First of all, is that a true statement? And if so, why can't the council also, by ordinance, adopt in incentives? They, they have the power to do that. Uh, the council, I suppose, the council could, and there probably are cases where there has been, you know, some kind of detail about incentives put directly into the code. Um, I think from the staff side, we don't anticipate that coming forward as part of this ordinance that goes before council. It's generally not good practice to put that level of detail into the code, in part because, as, as has been noted here, the, the funding for that incentive is unclear, and so we could end up in a situation where the code is telling us we have to provide incentives for certain things, but there's not a funding source to provide those incentives, and then it, it just creates an uncertainty or a sort of an inconsistency in city policy. So again, I think um, staff's approach and um, that we've sort of settled on over time is that the incentive part itself would not be directly codified into um, city code. Out of curiosity, do you think many that testified tonight understand that? Maybe it's just me that's, you know, coming to this realization? Um, I don't know to what extent that's really understood. I mean, in the end, there's not really a difference whether the city puts it directly into code or whether the city develops a program to uh, you know, provide those incentives. Um, Yet the ordinance is locking in rates. So I think it is a fair question, right? I mean, because the original staff recommendation was very specific, right? 50% of the lower zone and then the lower, or the lower zone for the upper zone lower zone would be 50% up to a cap. So that's pretty specific. Um, so I think we're just providing a different level of specificity. It's a real word, right? Um, now, whether or not council elects to implement that or not and how they implement that, whether it's in code or an administrative policy or however, um, I think it's a good recommendation. To move forward because in the past affordable housing has been had GFCs waived and I know that there's been a broad waiver I'm um, and as we've heard in testimony that protect perhaps the actual utility rates from the actual affordable housing projects can go to you know to pay off that GFC cost and I know that's not within our purview to consider, but I think there are mechanisms to pay for it on, other than the GFC, so. I, I agree that, I mean, these are policy the incentives so far, you know, they're, they're programs and policies that can be developed by the city, whether it's council and administration, but, you know, I, I think it's pretty critical to everyone's comprehension of this that there is I, I just made the argument for one zone versus two because with the assumption that then there's the ability to surgically go in and provide waivers and incentives and so forth so it is a critical piece of my recommendation on on, on that issue um, and then I'll just further saying I support that on the affordable 
but I also would support exploration into something that ties into our zoning and land use, you know, our development of, of uh, middle housing and densification and so forth. I don't know what that is, but I, if it's a broad recommendation to please go develop a program around that, I would like to see the city add that to the list. Well, and I, th I think the way we incentivize that is by recommending the movement to ERUs is that it does already incentivize densification by going to smaller units with a smaller fixture count. It, it does, and you know, but I also, I, I, I'm not personally satisfied that um, this utilization piece is not, is, isn't addressed. I, I wish there was a way to say that if you are developing large parcel properties, it's, you're not utilizing common infrastructure and so forth, and therefore that should be weighted in your fee. Now, I, that's, that's a whole new topic that we're not gonna solve tonight, but I wish that was part of the calculation. So if a, if a compromise is incentives from related to zoning, utilization, and so forth, then I would put that forward. Um, yes. So just, I guess, a quick clarification. I, I, perhaps I shouldn't speak on behalf of council. We don't know, I mean, the recommendation that comes forward that could include some kind of recommendation about incentives. It may be that council does decide to put something directly into mm -hmm. the code. So there's nothing that would prohibit council from doing that. This is ultimately just a recommendation being made by, by plan commission. I did want to clarify, did your amendment get a second and are we actually debating the amendment? It was, or? yeah, okay. we're debating the okay. amendment. Perfect. It was second I, I by remember, Commissioner Winger. So I wanted to clarify. Yeah. And that was just unaffordable. Just as on, yeah. 100% waiver on affordable housing. Okay. Any further discussion on the amendment? Okay, all in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, motion passes, six to zero. Do we have any further? Those were my motions, Mr. President. All right, thank you. Do we, Commissioner Winger? Uh, I have a question on the uh, uh, putting in place uh, one thing in here says March 5th, 2024 entirely. Uh, what about the phase in? Uh, have we decided that or is that in the original motion? In the original motion, it is phased in with 50% in March 5th, 2024. Of 2024, and then the remainder in March 5th, 2025. Okay because I didn't see it here. Okay, thank you. So I would make the one further amendment on what I was speaking on because I just, uh, the motion would be to um, recommend that in the findings of fact that council and staff consider uh, development incentives for related to um, middle housing. Second. Okay, so we have a first on Commissioner Bayreuther and then a second on Commissioner Neely. So to include in the findings of fact, to look for further incentives for middle housing. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? It's not specific, obviously, but it's the plan commission finds. Discussion? Oh, my, my only thought there, and of course this is gonna turn into potentially an other motion was um, you did specify middle housing. Um, is there any, do you have any concern over higher density housing um, in, you know, areas that are zoned for that, like in the downtown area, um, multi-level over six unit that they? No, no. Or we, we, is it because there are other incentives already in place for that type of housing. I, mean, I suppose technically, like I'm looking at MFT so forth, but um, if there's a better recommendation, I was tying it to new definitions and if assuming BOH goes through that we've now defined what middle housing means oh, in the city. Yeah. Sure, I, yeah. I just was, it excludes yeah. uh, high density housing from any um, incentives. Hmm. So I just was trying, wanting clarification on that. I'm open. Well, to do, it doesn't even exclude, I mean, it, his motion specifically. His specifically yes. calls it out middle yeah. housing, but it doesn't exclude city council of looking at 
different incentive programs no. for different, yeah. Yeah, I, I think if there's, I'm, I'm not for or against that, it's just the argument on when you get to those bigger types of developments is they're much more complex than, you know. Yeah. Commissioner Neely. Todd, would you consider adding high density housing to your motion? Um, that's fine, yeah. Then Mr. President, I make a motion that we amend his motion to include the words and high density housing. Yeah. I'll second that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and as long as staff understands our intent and, and they choose to reword that in the findings of fact and it's signed by the president, then that's okay. In that Do regard, can I just make sure I, I understand? So your proposal or your motion would be to include in the findings of fact um, a essentially a recommendation for the city to provide incentives for middle housing. Is mm -hmm. that Middle housing and at and this point, the add, amended and high motion density. would be to add high density to that. Yeah. Okay. Correct. And if you have a better way to capture that, we're we're open. <laughs> and yeah, what we can do is staff can write up the language of that, and then I'll review it when yep. I sign the findings of facts. So. Yeah. Because yep. yep. technically, findings of fact are written by the secretary, but. Yeah, that's correct. So, so any further discussion on that motion? Commissioner Williams. I, I guess I'm not in favor in that we just ask the city to find what I think will be approximately a million dollars for the uh, to GFC waivers for the very low income housing um, that for the waivers that have traditionally been out there. And so this, well, a desirable goal um, I'm not sure that we've had enough discussion about can the city afford this? Is what are the nature of those incentives? So, it, and it feels a little bit outside the scope of the discussion we're having today. So, I'm not opposed to it, but I'm I'm not ready to vote for something like that right now until we kind of talk a little bit more about what that might mean and how would it be funded and what are those incentives? Um, it's Commissioner Patterson. I guess my response to that would simply be that we're not asking them to do it, just to consider it. Um, I'm, my reasoning behind supporting it is I wouldn't want to make it seem as though that's not something that is a concern and that, that this fee structure without that consideration doesn't really provide for any incentives to, beyond just um, for as for higher density housing, just in general, just it doesn't, it doesn't. There's no incentive. I mean, it's a small incentive maybe to use ERU, but other than that, there's no development incentive um, for uh, higher density housing in in areas of our city that are more built out and for infrastructure beyond just water. But I don't think that they're that we're asking the city to, or the, even the city council to say, yes, we're going to do this, and that they have to identify those funding sources immediately. I'm not gonna support the motion because, well, it's Todd, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's not months. true. That's <laughs> not. Two more months. Wow, I'm getting tired of parenting. Um, no, because I think, to me, we really want to incentivize affordable housing. And I think there's mechanisms to do there. Yes, I want to see higher density housing uh, throughout the city, um, but there's only so many incentives that we can provide through different mechanisms. And so if we incentivize it, okay, well, let's incentivize middle housing. Let's incentivize higher density housing. I'm, Let's incentivize affordable housing. Then, okay, who doesn't get an incentive? At that point, it's commercial, industry, uh, and single fi single unit homes. Mm -hmm. Single family. I'm I'm going to call them single family homes. I'm stuck on that one. But you know, so 
I think there's a limit on how many different carve outs we can create for incentives. So I'm, I'm not gonna support yeah. it. I, I think it's an and, and if council and staff decide, determine it's an or, then they, they can make that, term. but we're asking them to explore it. And I think it's on the same argument as been made on affordable, that there are other ways for that, for that capitalization of that. So that's, we're just asking the city to, if they want housing, we need to figure out a way to get that barrier and decrease that barrier up front. And if they can f show how to capitalize and pay for it, then that's great. I think that argument was very strong that had been made on the, on the affordable side. So same argument to me. Commissioner Neely. Um, much like uh, Todd just said, I mean, the areas of, of uh, high density housing, middle housing, homelessness is a housing issue. And I think the more we can add our voice to uh, those calling for incentives to increase the development of those two cohorts of housing types, um, the, the better off uh, we're going to be in terms of addressing that complex issue. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, um, this is the amendment to include in the findings of fact uh, for city council to look at additional incentives for middle housing and high density housing. Can I just clarify? I think the original motion only had middle housing. There was a motion a friendly to- amendment. Oh, it was a friendly amendment. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Okay. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, motion passes four to two. And I have one more, and it's, it's very similar, uh, and I would propose, make a motion um, to recommend uh, in the findings of fact that council explore the PDA um, incentives or waivers. I'm sorry, ex ex explore what? The incentives or waivers in a PDA. Oh, PDA. Yeah. Second. Okay, so motion is from Commissioner Bayreuther, second is from Commissioner Winger to consider waivers for the PDAs. And just to reevaluate them, basically. Well, and again, the same, to me, that's the same argument because we're not identifying what the funding source is, Mary, to your <laughs> question that I overheard on the mic. No. <laughs> But, but no, but, but that's, the, that's what a PDA is set up to do, is, is, to, is to use future taxation. So that could be a different mechanism. Affordable housing, you know, um, workforce or market rate housing, and then PDAs. They're all just different mechanisms that are, that are capitalizing on, on assets. And that's what we're talking about here. Investment, the city's making investments in assets. All, what are all the different ways we can cap, they, they can capitalize on it? That's the big basis. I'm going to support this because I'm, because it's tied. No. <laughs> uh, no, I'm going to support this because, one, the waivers are already in place. And what this does is kind of make a recommendation to evaluate what sort of mechanisms are there for either to retain those waivers or renegotiate on the agreements or to, if they're gonna retain them, how are they gonna fund them? So I think it's a, a good thing for city council to do, and I think it's gonna be th something that's necessary for them to do. Commissioner Neely. I'm going to support this um, by uh, putting ditto under what uh, Commissioner Francis just said. Okay, thank you. Any further discussions on the motion? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. One abstention, so motion passes five, zero, and one.
Thank you. Okay. Do we have any additional amendments? Commissioner Winger. I have a question. Uh, if a commissioner uh, voted against one of the amendments to the original, uh, can they still uh, send a letter to uh, city council on that position if they vote for the main amendment, the main motion? I don't think so. It, you'd have to vote against the main. So you have to vote against yes, the main. To be a dissenting opinion. I've been in this trap before, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Thank you. I just wanted a clarification. But that is a good clarification. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Any additional motions or discussion? And just to clarify, it's because it becomes process at that point. So. Okay. Before we vote, I'm going to say I'm going to support this with the amendments. I'm because the city does need to recover the, the fees or the cost. And right now, so much of that cost is being borne by the ratepayer. And in future, we're just gonna see increased ratepayer rates to make up for any lack of change within the GFC structure. So I think it's important that we update the GFC and I'm, I'm glad to see it indexed to, um, so we don't have to revisit this often or council doesn't. Uh, so I think it's good that it is indexed and so and I'm Glad that we've created the carve-outs or the the waivers for affordable housing um, And the other considerations so I will support this Approval I don't know the whole thing <laughs> I'll just say thank you staff has left but thank you for educating us and this was unusual for us We normally don't hear these types of policy, more policy related issues, but thank you for everyone for educating us. Yes. Any additional comments before a vote? Hey, Angie, if you can do a roll call vote, please. Todd Bayrother. Aye. Greg Francis. Aye. Chris Neely. Aye. Ryan Patterson? Aye. Tim Williams? Aye. Cliff Winger? Nay. Motion passes five to one. Thank you very much. With that, we are adjourned.